This is the third and final week of our songwriting workshop with Larry Boskin. And we have two very special guests today who are going to also speak about um, the music industry and writing and publishing and all this stuff. We have uh, Brooke Cremont, Vice President of Writer uh, Publisher Relations for Chair Lane Music, that's chair. And uh, Mark Emmert Petner, uh, again Vice President of Writer Publisher Relations from the organization ASCAP. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you all for coming back. Uh, how many of you have been in the last two classes that we've had? Okay, so most of you. And welcome all of you who have heard about it and just stopped in. I'm going to, just to give you the format of what we're going to do today, I, I like the interaction between us and you all. So I'm going to try to keep the lecturing of you to a minimum today so people could play songs or read lyrics that they have get critiques and feedback from Mark and Brooke, and also open it up so you can ask questions, because they've both been in the business for a long time. They're seasoned professionals. They help people like you who come to them and are part of their organizations to expand their careers. So you're going to people who are actually actively doing it every day in the business, as opposed to people who didn't make it and now write a book about it or something else. So. So, so they, there's a saying by this uh, motivational speaker, Anthony Robbins, that smart people ask better questions. So don't be afraid to ask questions, because that's how you learn and grow and expand. Uh, just to begin with, we, we left off last week in a rush talking about production. And you know, part of what we've covered so far is looking at lyrics and looking at chord progressions and melody, tension and releases, how you put a song together in a classic sense. And then once you have a song, it's sort of like the then what's next. And you know, I said this before, there are two things. There's a hit song, and then there's a hit production. And so sometimes the two things come together. You could have a song like Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and then it's done by the Hawaiian artist whose name is escaping me, who's really famous. But that production with that reggae beat takes a hit song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and, and just gives new life to it and, and becomes a hit production. Other songs, like Yeah by Usher, for instance, it's more about the production. It's more about Little John rapping. It's more about just that yeah, yeah, with that synth line going mm, ah, mm, ah. And if I tried to play yeah on the piano, it would really sound awful. So the idea is, you know, you really hit the bullseye dead on if you can have a hit song and then put it together with a hit production. Then, then you get like, a, you get what's going on. You get living for the city. You get, you know, one of those songs that just lives forever. And other people can approach and other people can work on. So again, I just want to give you a little example of how moldable the clay is of music. And, you know, a while ago, I. You know, Madonna, for years, works with and often discovers people that you've never heard of, like before that time, like Jelly Bean Benitez, or Chef Pettibone, or um, Pat Leonard, or there are a variety of people who she kind of championed. So I had a friend at her record company who was saying, Larry, bring me stuff from Madonna. So I, I had another friend who, you know, long ago, it's, been, it's actually happened since, but he said, Larry, what if we sampled the Billy Jean beat? You know, and wrote a song over that sense, that You know, it was this really hot beat. And I thought, wow, that's going to be something great. And then he had a list of titles. And the title that stuck out for me was Feeling Ye, Feeling You. Because I thought like it has this opposite thing. You know, you and me, and it's like the yin and the yang. So I took this idea, and I'm just using this as an example to show you how the songs evolve and how the production is important. So I took that kind of like... And, and I thought, well, I can't just do that, because then I'm going to get sued. So I kind of took it live, and I went like... And then I also like with that kind of beat, there's also like some kind of like Motown. There's a couple of Motown songs that kind of move like that, you know, like I'll Be There. And so I had like half Motown in my mind. So I just started riffing and I was doing something like, in the sun. 
to the major and that was how I, I, I broke it up and I, I, I did have that and somewhere that was in there too so I did what people do sometimes I started thinking about it too much and then I was stuck and so this lyricist came in in LA and we were staying at the Standard Hotel and there's the signs upside down and there's like a model old girl in a fish tank behind the front desk reading a magazine. And it's like trying really hard to be cool and trendy. And so we started writing this idea. And, you know, she had, you know, we just had this idea from the lobby. Like people actually came to just hang out in the lobby of this hotel because they might run into some director or something and get a part in a movie if they decided. So, we just start writing this, uh, uh, Everybody's a tiny tune, I don't care what I wrote, but basically I feel the best, I just wanna dance, I just wanna lose myself, I just wanna chance to let it, let it go, let it be me, let me, let it be me, let it be me, right here, right now. And so we kind of like that. For people, and so I want to just play you how the evolution. So can we do the first, uh, the first song? So this, so what I'm going to play you first is just a little writing tape, and it's got like in the background the Billy G B and the girls just kind of riffing like I was, and, and so this is the writing tape of the song. And, and mind you, just to let you know where it ended up, is the song eventually was. to the fame movie. I'm competing against some soundtrack supervisor or director that like literally has a pile of tapes to the ceiling and some of them are like just the, directly the songs on like the new Jay-Z record or the songs on the Lady Gaga record that you could put a Lady Gaga song on the record or you could put feelings on it. Which are you going to choose? So if I sent them that song, you know, at that production level, I'm, I'm asking a lot. I'm asking like Pick an unknown, pick somebody who doesn't have, you know, a track record as much as somebody like Madonna or Lady Gaga or something. And then also try to hear through that production to what it might sound like. And really, it's, it's really asking a lot. So, this girl happened to be, that I wrote the lyrics with, married to a guy who was working for Tommy Mottola at Sony Records. And so, her husband was the guy who was engineering, you know, J-Lo and, uh, Mark Anthony and Ricky Martin and Celine Dion. Like literally, he was Walter A. I can't pronounce his last name. It's some long, as a long enough kind of name. But he was Walter A's studio guy. So he was making hit record after hit record. And he said, if you want me to help with the production and everything. So, so it went from me with my idea to the guy with the title. And then they did this demo. So let's put it number two. And so suddenly I at least had somebody who could really make the, the recording sound. Yeah. 
sounds a lot different, right? And this was, along the way we realized that if we put that sample of, of Beat It in there and actually use the actual drum from the record, it could prevent someone from recording it because then I have to pay like a sampling fee of like half a million dollars and who wants to do that? And you have like a million songs you don't have to pay anything for. So we got rid of the Michael Jackson beat and it still works. So I started pitching this around and my friend at, at Madonna's company said this is perfect to follow up Ray of Light. She's got electronica and psychedelic and, and <coughs> send it, I'll send it to her and then it disappeared down a rabbit hole never get an answer from her. So then my friend at MCA Records had this artist, Noah Tishti, who was huge, like the Madonna of Israel, who's come here. And, she, and the record company, MCA, loved it, and then the artist said it was too commercial. So, you know, it was, it's usually the artist likes it, and the record company doesn't like it, now the record company liked it, the artist didn't. So that didn't happen. And then my friends from the Berman Brothers, a production team that did the real McCoy and who let the dogs out and Hanson and Amber and all these various pop records were launching a singer named Kim Sozi and they had a deal at Sony with their new label. So they said this would be perfect for us to launch this girl Kim. And even though it was a no-name person, I thought a no-name person it's more important to almost than somebody like J-Lo or something where it's just another song. So this was the first record, the next one was number three.
So as you can hear, like it's the same song and it's gone in like a lot of different directions. And the point is, is that um, a good song is like clay. You can pull it and mold it into different things because it's words and music. And you know, from me doing a really good recording, it got onto a record and it uh, became a number one Billboard dance hit and then nominated for a Grammy in 2001. And of course, we lost to Gloria Stefan. But it just sort of has a life of its own. It's on two more records coming out. Chris Cox, who's a big like nightclub DJ, has it on his solo record. And I'm totally new versions from when you sing it. There's a country artist that's doing it. So we're always pitching it to people. And uh, and I, I started out as the only writer, and I literally gave half the royalty to the guy who just, at the end of the day, came up with the words, feeling me, feeling you, not even the whole title, because I'd rather have half of something than all of nothing. So I, I just really encourage everyone to not be greedy or stingy. I know when you write your first songs, or you get one song, and it says, man, that's a hit, you're like, it's precious, I don't want anyone to hear it, they might steal it, anything. Let me just tell you, not only do people not steal your song, but if you threw yourself through the plate glass window at Sony Records, they probably wouldn't blink. They'd say, did you hear something? No, I didn't. Because it's so hard. So you actually have to go the opposite way and hope that people like your music enough to even consider stealing it. Because the real professionals, they don't want a golden egg. They don't want one good song. They want a golden goose that lays lots of eggs. They want Carrie DeGuardi or Diane Warren or Carole King or Joni Mitchell or David Foster, or somebody who just had hit after hit after hit, decade after decade, you know, people are doing those songs. And that's what people really want. They don't want to just steal your one idea. And I, I also want to say this because it comes up a lot. In another class, somebody said, you know, I have this idea for this song, Bad Boys, and they sent it to this producer, and the next thing you know, there's a song called The Bad Boys, and he stole my idea, and that's it. I'm never sending out another song. I said, well, are, are you only going to have one idea in your whole life? And is that it? And I said, you know, I don't know if you know it, but there's a thing called the collective subconscious that Carl Jung pointed out, that we all are connected, like an aboriginal tribesman and a housewife in Kansas will have the same dream on the same night, and there's part of your brain. I said, you know, I, I don't think Sean Combs snuck into your house at night to come up with Bad Boy Entertainment, the name of his production company and the record company. There have been Bad Boy films. You probably were just feeling the vibe. You know, it's like Bob Dylan said, the answer is blowing in the wind. When there's something in the air, like a lot of people pick up on it, not just one person. So I would just get out there with your music. And to talk to you about, you know, that um, production as well, you, uh, you owe it to yourself, whether you do it yourself on GarageBand or something. Um, people hire me all the time that I've worked with from other classes or meet through friends that aren't famous, and I work with them on their music. And, and the difference is I actually know people, and I pitch one of the people that I've worked with, I'm, I'm happy to say, has a song in a NBC movie that's coming out. Another one has a song out with Adam Lambert from American Idol, which are holding for his album. So it's also good to get with somebody who can do good work and maybe help open the door for you. Again, Carrie DeGuardi, the way she got in wasn't just by sending a song to record companies or publishers. She hooked up with John Shanks, who was, happened to be producing uh, Michelle Branch at the time and then Britney Spears at the time. So she worked with somebody who had the in. So if you can you know, find someone like that, you know, that, that has ends, you, you ride with them, you ride into the door with them. And if anyone has any questions or wants to talk to me, my email is on the top of the, the email page and I can't say anything. Do we'll get to it. Do you have to I, I sometimes do. I've been busy the last two weeks, so I apologize to anyone who hasn't, whose email and has, hasn't. But I do answer my emails and I do get to them. So if you have any questions or want to know, more about it or more about what I do. I can't guarantee or promise anything because I'm really busy right now. But email me and if I can't help, I can direct you to somebody who could help hook you up with the songs of what they're doing.
And it's better to have one great song that's really produced well and sounds like a hit than to have like 20 mediocre songs. Because it's like a key, if it's cut just right, you put it in the lock, it just opens it right up. And one little niche is off, you're sitting there and your hand hurts and you're fighting with it and it doesn't open. So one good song will lead you all the way. Um, what I'd like to do now, so that we have as much time as possible, is open is to invite our special guest to kind of come down here. And just, like, I, I just want to start by saying, you know, I'm, I'm coming to the chase a little bit here, because usually they talk about life and what they do and everything, and I'd rather just actually jump in first with a couple of questions and just kickstart the, the thing. And, and some of the questions you're going to have for Brooke or for Mark are just things you've thought about either as a songwriter, how to get your songs out there, or as a, um, artists, like how to get your music heard, like they, they do this all the time to help artists get noticed. So, so who has a question? Is that okay? Do you want to just say a little bit about it? Alright, so who has a question? What would you say is the most effective way to get your music? That's a nice general question. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's great that you guys are doing stuff like this. There are lots of events, and you have easy access to New York City from here and where everybody lives. But there are a ton of events that are going on. BMI has a mask now, has a show mark, can tell you about some events. There's AIMP events, there's um, SPONY events. So there's a lot of events that are going on in an event. Even open mic nights, you can go down and sign up and perform two songs, that type of thing. There's there's a lot of networking opportunities for you guys to to go out and you know get yourself out there and meet people like us and meet people in the industry, meet other songwriters, other producers in your in your genre, whatever it may be. There's a ton ton of stuff like that. But I think the best place to start usually is your BMI or ASCAP representative and find out you know what kind of events they have going on for you to. Yeah, I would I would agree. I would say that uh, you know, being able to FaceTime meeting people, if you don't have maybe like an attorney or a manager, or someone actually doing it, like, then it's, it's upon you to to get out there, and, and it makes all the difference. Uh, uh, meeting with somebody to play the music versus uh, me having to scour the internet for it or something like that. So if you can get in uh, to actually meet these people or go to these events. That makes a huge difference, um, and, and yeah, ASCAPs and DMIs, um, you know, we, that's a huge part of what we do, so it'd be a really good idea to meet, with, if, if you are affiliated with one of them, meet one of the reps in whatever genre that you're working in, and if you're not affiliated with one of them, you should be, it's uh, Does that do what you guys do? Well, the nuts and bolts of what we do uh, are to represent our writers, people that join, writers and publishers. And whenever we have a performance, so internet, TV, radio, live, we collect those royalties and then we pay you and the publishers for them. So that's, that's in, in kind of a financial institution in that respect. However, um, because it is what it is, uh, because there's, we now know everybody, we, we between all our offices, we know all the players, all the managers, the lawyers, the publishers. We become this uh, sort of place to go to for for referrals or to help you navigate, you know, what to do with your music. So, so a huge portion of what I do, I work in the creative area, is to to do that. If I if we have a meeting and you have a great song and you need to know what to do with it, I would send it to the right people, to the labels, to the publishers. I would help you figure out how to get your song to the right people. Uh, showcases, things like that. So, um, BMI does the same thing. So, it's great. Uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put some information on the, on the board. And, or I pass this around. I just want to point out with what they just said on this sheet that I just pointed out a minute ago that has my name and, and my email today is the future at Gmail. Right underneath it, it says networking events and it has www.ascap.com, www.bmi.com. And if you go on these sites, you can both look at how you sign up, what the criteria are, because there are voting, not voting members, but there are people who have a certain affiliation status because you have a record coming out or something they can track. 
And then there are some events that are just open to the public and general population where you can go and meet people, like they have open mic nights or songwriting circles and things, that you can uh, just be in a room full of people who have already had songs published, or lawyers and people, and you can find collaboration partners. You hear somebody singing who's a great singer, so you can go up to them after and say, I love your work. Do you ever collaborate, or would you would be willing to sing on one of my tracks, you know? And you really kind of meet the right people. And then the Grammy.com, which is Naris, they hold all kinds of events. I've gone to internet networking things and cyber PR things about how to get your music out using the internet, and they, they find top people to come in and just talk to you, and it costs like 20 bucks or something, and you have like a, a free class, and it's just really top information from either ASCAP or BMI or the Grammys that you get, and it, you're lucky because you're right here in New York. It's all happening either here or LA or Nashville. So please uh, keep going. So if you guys, if you don't know what an ASCAP or BMI are, you really should, because that's like, that is, we are the next step. If you are planning on, on having a career in music and earning any sort of money, you, we need to be in the picture, either at the be a minor season. We're an integral part of what you're about to do. It's massively important. It's probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the puzzle, too. So you should know about these companies. You should join. We're, we're only here to either get you paid or to help your career, not for profit. It's a no-brainer. I actually had two questions. First of all, how difficult is it to join like an ASCAP or BMI? And because I read some of the requirements and they just was wondering how competitive and difficult it is to join one of the organizations. Uh, it's not. I mean, we just ask that you have a reason to join. So if you're, you know, uh, if all you do is uh, write, write for your wife or husband, and then that's it, then there's no reason to join. But if you have songs out there, if you have songs on MySpace, if you're playing live, if you have a record out, then there's a reason to join. And then the second question I had, which is for both of you, uh, let's say you're kind of uh, in a position where you have like producers interested or shows or other things interested, but you're not represented, would that be a good time to and, uh, ask for an ASCAP or publishing help? And then if so, uh, can they like put financial power to it? Because like, I kind of have some I could talk to you afterwards, but let's say it's just if you have interest, where do you, how do you go about uh, presenting it? If you have interest and you're already an ASCAP member? No, I'm not. Okay, okay, well, if you were, you know, or, or BMI, I would suggest going, you know, meeting with the rep and telling what's going on. Okay. Um, you know, it really depends on the situation. If we can help, if I know some of the players, if I can help stir the pot. I mean, so much of it, you know, to be honest with you, so. Everybody's looking for a song. We're in the music industry, right? So everyone's looking for a song or, or songs. It is the currency that keeps this economic system alive. If you've got a great song, or you're a great songwriter, everybody wants to know about it. And a lot of it, you know, when I used to manage, it's about smoke and mirrors, too. It's about stirring the pot. It's about, you know, you should hear about this. You should hear about this. And, and, and that, you know, so that's the kind of stuff you should be leveraging. Someone at ASCAP, someone at BMI is, is kind of there for that, you know? I just have a quick question. Uh, I have two ASCAP accounts. I have both uh, my band mm -hmm. and my production team. Um, how do I go about like contacting an actual representative and sitting down and showing them my material? Like, um, well, I'll, I'll I'll pass on my card. Um, okay. But also, you know, there's it's membership across the board. But we also do have special specialized genres. So I'm, I tend to be more pop rock and film and TV music. Okay, but we yeah. have we have. Urban, we have uh, musical theater, we, you know, so depending on where you fall, it would probably right. be good to direct you in there. Yeah, I just really need like, actual directions towards like, because I have a specific genre in my band, mm -hmm. like progressive uh, experimental rock, mm -hmm. kind of like a post hardcore kind of thing. And then my production team is like completely different, it's all hip hop and pop. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, it's very, and we also do RB and electronic, but they're, they're separate, you know what I mean? I would, I would like to find out a way to contact the separate yeah. the industry, you know what I mean? Well, I'll, I'll give you my card. Sure. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to know how much time it was a license. I'm sorry. How much cost for license? You, you, you joined BMI? Yeah. And you want to know how much? License. It's like a summary license. Yeah, I don't know. BMI basically it's free to join and then you know you register all your songs with them and 
and then they go and they track your songs for you. I don't know what you mean by like. It's only if you use them on the other page. Oh, no, sorry. No. It's about as simple as like filling out a library card application. Just yeah. you know. not that it was like the same type of cash application. No. Yeah. You just you want to join in two capacities. You want to join as a writer and you want to join as a publisher. And then once you once you've established both memberships, the last piece of the puzzle is registering your songs with us. So that grants us the ability to go out and represent you and collect money. How much is the initial fee for asking? To what? The initial fee for asking. Uh no. There's a $25 application processing fee, but it's $25 one time. Actually, I don't know how much we have on it. But now, is it free? I haven't worked there before. I, I, think, I used to work there, but. I think it's free to join as a writer and start publishing something like $150. Yeah. We, yeah, we went, we went with ASCAP because we, we saw that BMI was a little more expensive. Mm -hmm. okay. But, I mean, in all, in all honesty, I think it's worth it anyway to get over. I, I just want to, as a as a creative person who's worked for years with people at both companies, as a BMI writer, literally one of the people, Mark Fried, who's not there now, introduced me to one of the Beach Boys years ago, and I started writing with Al Jardine. And I'm working with him now, and I'm, I'm producing Alec Baldwin next week on a voiceover, and we have this pop band that's brand new called the Fleet Foxes that the, these beautiful singers, um, almost like Simon Garfunkel, and you know, and he's got all these greats on his record, and it's it's an iconic thing because it's the Beach Boys, and it came from a connection at at a performing rights organization, and that's almost like what you'd hope a manager would do, or a, or an agent, or a publisher. So they can really help, and I, I you know a lot of people come and it's sort of like auditioning for a job. You know, you feel like you fill out a form and just say I'm highly qualified. But there's a human relationship thing, too, where when I meet people sometimes, I, I may not work with them for 10 years, but I'll say, like, I'm having a party. Do you want to come over? I'm having Thanksgiving. Come over to my house. I've got tickets to hair. Do you want to come? And it's not just, like, what I can get or an agenda. It's just genuinely, like, I'd like to, this road of life is this mystery, this adventure, this mystery, like, come and hang out. And so I've developed friendships with people that, that maybe don't ever end up in any business happening, but it, it, you know, you have really good people to kind of ask questions and advice to and everything. So if you do join ASCAP or BMI, like, and you, something great is happening, like invite them to something. Say, we've got tickets to like the Yankees playoff that I got from my cousin, you wanna come? Like, you don't know, the person could be a biggest Yankees fan and be like so grateful to you for doing something that means a lot to them. And, and it's a currency of community and friendship. So even if you don't know what you have to offer, like bake some cookies or something, you know? Like do something, you know, this guy, Bert Padel, was the business manager for years at the Yankees and everything. He used to like bake cookies and send them to like Madonna and she'd be like, this crazy business manager is like baking cakes and writing poems about me. And it was very endearing. Like she wanted to, to be in business with this guy because it was more than business. It was friendship. Yeah, I, I, I could say that. Uh, like I, I was a recording artist. Uh, I've been in the, probably about 16 years, and I, you know, I was on labels and publishing deals, and all of that happened not because I was a fantastic writer, but because I had met the right person. I dated the girl that knew this guy, and all of a sudden the phone call came in, and that, that my career started and, and it was maintained and sustained because of that. Because like the, the weird sort of I was there at the right time. It was more than that. I was there, I was everywhere because I knew one of them was going to be the right time, and, and that's so massively important. And, and even like uh, an artist that uh, a songwriter that I work with at ASCAP uh, that I uh, subsequently got a. I, got a deal at EMI publishing through me and like now she's writing with Shakira and Katie Tunstall and all the all these people like her career has blossomed. That happened because I was walking down the street, she recognized me from a band, whatever, but she comes up to me and she starts talking to me and she's a total kook and I'm I'm intrigued because she's kinda kooky and arty and weird. She comes into my office, has no demos, but she starts singing to me, like, I wrote this song, I'm singing Whitney Houston. And I'm like, I wrote this song, I'm singing Queens of the Stone Age. And, she's, and I'm so intrigued by this person who's put herself out there that the next week I, I have a meeting with EMI and I, I, I do this hookup and now he signs her and here we go. And that's like a, a, a great example of 
how, how do you get your music out there? You just do it. You, you find the people. It's, it's, you, you pick a very difficult field to get into. You're not only the writers, but you're your own champion, your own manager, your own publisher. That means you have to wear several hats. It means going out there, meeting, and, and that's a huge part of it. Yeah, that's, that's kind of my problem. Like, I deal with a lot of industry people who go to the studio I go to record at. Mm -hmm. And um, like I perform a lot, a lot of places. I network very well, but it's all by myself. Mm -hmm. Like I pay for my own mixing, my own mastering. And I wanted to know, like, is there any, is there any good artist management that you would recommend? Uh -huh. Why don't you tell about artist share? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, He's got a good idea for everybody. Yeah, okay. This, there's a company called Artist Share. It's a really interesting setup. Write it down. Yeah. It's a really interesting setup. The, the catch will be that you need a fan base to really pull it off. So when you get to the point where you've got. But, Sorry, Sorry. Um, I, I had a meeting with an A&R and he explained the same thing, that my writing was good and my music was good, but he wanted to see more of a fan base. Kevin Law, mm -hmm. Universal. Well, well that, that, that's going to be a universal sorry, uh, claim, I think, that, that okay, in the music industry at this point, everybody's heads are on the chopping block. Right? Nobody, although everyone's looking for the hit song, everyone's scared to death because if they sign it, their name gets attached to it, and if it fails, guess who loses the job? So, um, what everyone's kind of looking for is for you guys to get yourselves up and running enough so that the record company or whatever doesn't have to start from scrap. But they can take your momentum and just take it to the next level. So that means whatever, touring, placements, um, come, to, come to the table with a story. Um, that's a huge part of it. Nobody, it, it, the climate is, is such that nobody wants to take that huge financial risk to break an artist that nobody's heard of, but if you can say, but I've already, I'm selling out clubs here, I've got this going on, whatever, Jay-Z's calling, and it, all those things add up to something like, it's like a business proposal, like, oh, okay, now this investment looks good. And then, unfortunately, that's what this is, you know, it's, it's, it's way beyond just the art, it's, you know, it's business. Yeah, I noticed that by working independently, mm -hmm. but, um, do you have any, like, websites that maybe you could get promotions in on or, like, you know, there's, there's a website called uh, musiciancoaching.com, mm. and uh, it's a guy who's an A&R, and he's been, in the, been in, the, in the field for a while. I, I honestly don't, I think it's like $150 for a session, and he'll sit with you and go through everything and be like, it's to the most obvious things people don't realize, like, this website sucks. You need to do this assist. Like, if you're doing bios, it should be more like this. You should do, join this company, you should do this. Like, you can get sit with them in a session and have some sort of plan out, uh, a plan of attack. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, yeah, there's no real rule of thumb. I would just say knowledge, know what you're doing. There's a, a book that I always recommend called Making Music Make Money. And it talks about the fact that you guys are not only the writers, but until you sign a publishing deal, you are, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm learning, so I'm writing it down. So, until you sign a publishing deal, you are your own publisher. And that means it's your job to exploit your music. And I mean that in a positive way. Go out there, right? So, so this book, Making Music Make Money, make money talks about how to do that. I, mean, I, I want, what, what, it depends on what you want to, Achieve, but like, say you're just a writer and you want to get it to Madonna. Let's talk about how we can do that. And so, it, like, we we break down some some of it's very obvious, and some of it's like, okay, I didn't know that. And someone like me who's been doing this forever, I was reluctant to read the book because I thought I kind of knew it all. But I learned a lot from it. And it's a really simple book, um, making music make money. Um, MusicianCoaching.com. Um, other than that, I mean, that's the process. You should be representing yourself. There's, because when you, when you eventually hire someone, you need to know what their job is doing. And the only way to do this is because you've done it before. And, and you also have to be making enough money already for someone to spend their time, energy, and money on you. It's like a really good person is busy. Like you could probably find somebody like down the block for free, but they, don't, they know less about it than you do. So it's like it makes it worse. So the more you build it, the more they will come. Let's 
direct a few questions at Brooke to keep the <laughs> circle going if you want. And okay, well, I work at a publishing company, so that's kind of what the next step would be. Um, after you've got your ASCAP affiliation done and, um, you know, you've met there, usually, you know, you, if you have some songs that are pretty viable out there, you know, maybe for films, TV shows, other artists, if you want to get co-writes, you know, that type of thing, that's when you would start looking for a publishing deal. Um, and what my particular role it is at Cherry Lane as the company is I really work our catalog and try to get placements so, you know, and background spots in films and TV shows. And that's pretty much what my job is. It's really in marketing. So any way we can to bring in additional income for our songs, for our catalog. And we have, you know, everybody from big people like Elvis Presley and the Black Eyed Peas and John Legend to smaller emerging artists that we're working and that we really believe in and that we sign early on to try to get, you know, we, we see a lot of promise in them. Um, I'm just going to take this question. Uh, um, do you guys happen to work with Brian Mayer Queen? No. I just wonder how much he grosses every time we go rock you know, and <laughs> sports rings. Yeah, I'm sure he, he makes a good penny. <laughs> Um, I had a question for everybody that's here, like you said, the people that are here in the class. Is there such thing as like a and or a representative believing in the artists without a fan base? Not in this day and age? That happens, yeah. yeah. We signed somebody um, about a year ago out of just seeing her at the bitter end. She came down from Boston and played to about five people, including me and my boss, and we ended up signing her. Is there any way to actually contact you and sit down? Yeah. yeah. I mean what I would what I suggest people do at first is to get their online presence going. You know, you get your MySpace page up, you get your yeah. four or five best songs up there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to reach out to people like me too early. Um, because you really you know, you don't want to spoil that. You want to send me when you, when you think it's good really right. Impression. Yeah, a good first impression because, you know, if in a year from now you really are a lot better, I'm going to always remember it and our days are so hectic and busy, I'm going to say, oh, I listened to that already, it wasn't that good, and maybe I'll get to it the next time a year comes by, you know? Um, so you want to be really careful with when you reach out to people and they and our people and publishers and stuff like that. Can we hear from a few people who haven't asked questions yet just to keep it all? Moving around the room. Um, so taking the whole fan base thing, like I've been doing the whole open night thing, and like I've been basically getting a lot of shows. Like, how do you take that to the next level? Well, are you performing the songs? Yeah. yeah. Have you been trying to get gigs at, at venues? Mm -hmm. And how's that going? It's going good. Like yeah. I've been getting a lot of shows. I got shows in October, mm -hmm. and uh, just like trying to like, get out of it and try to move up. Mm -hmm. and, like, Right. What kind of venues are you playing at? Hip hop. Um, you know, another thing, probably the next step would be to maybe try to get on a show with maybe a bigger name artist, you know, supporting or opening for them. Um, you know, if you have these venues that are really supportive of you, maybe if they're going to book somebody that has a big following, you can ask if you can go on maybe for 15 minutes before that person, you know, performs so that you can get their audience captivated. Um, you know, I would say that's a good way to start, you know, at least conquering the New York area. I just want to say something as well. That, uh, does anyone have the email? Phone list from last week. I don't. You do. I don't. Okay. I. I does any? Because it went around and then it never came back to me. Um, so someone has everyone's email and phone, and I just have it so that I can thank everyone and also keep you posted if something really cool is happening. I, I sometimes will post breakthroughs of people like you that are students that suddenly get a song in a movie or film or something happening. So I'm going to pass it around again. Just print really clearly, especially your email, don't rush. And then please remember, whoever has it last, like to go around and then in the back and bring it up to me at the end, whoever. Well, ju just for this, give us your card afterward, but also put your name and email on this, because sometimes the card will get lost, but this won't get lost, except for last week. <laughs>
So continuing on, do you want to answer it tomorrow? Okay. I had a question. Um, Let me just go back and, okay. and again, just get a, a, as many of you who haven't spoken yet, spoken and then come back around and do it. I just want to make a real serious comment. How do you both companies? The thing about a lot of what they're telling you is that they're not coming to you. And I hope you guys understand that. They're not coming to you. When you, when you join ASCAP, when you're a member of ASCAP, they have so many events. You don't even know which one you can't go to. Because that's how you have to really think. I've been to so many just workshops that they have just to see the kind of people that go there. Um, but you have to want to go to the hip hop showcase as much as you should be going to the film uh, workshop. That's what you should, you should be going to the concert music workshop. It may not be your thing, but they have so many things that you can go to that you just have to really figure out, okay, which one am I not going to because I have to work, okay? And with the Chuck and music publishing thing, you know, it's not just about music publishing, it's also about writing books and things like that. So these things are out there, and I'm just telling you, um, it's a lot bigger um, than you'll ever think, and it's phenomenal. You may make a trip one summer to go to the South by Southwest show just to be amongst these people who are doing the same thing you're doing or a genre that's completely different than the fact that you travel to these other music of things uh, shows your dedication and the importance of doing so. So understand that just because it's not your genre doesn't mean that you shouldn't go and check it out anyway. Does anybody even know what concert music is? Anybody even know what that is? Do you even know what, do you even know what that's like, concert music? That's like a horn band. Okay, that's like people playing like uh, like holiday music on like big, you know, tubas and trumpets and things. But it's a real genre that people, you know, concert music is really a huge, huge thing that people write for. And sometimes those people get their music in films. So just think a little bigger than whatever the genre is that you're really thinking about that you know. This actually is a uh, question in regards to something you were saying earlier about um, how you're looking for something like Golden Goose, like you were saying. Um, would you consider something like that for the 80s to be someone, if you're in a rock band like Metallica, uh, they were already up and established up until Justice for All and they just took uh, Of course. I mean, that's like. Because yes. a lot of people are saying it might be the opposite way because Lars is a good. I mean, when you come to the table and you're like selling out coliseums, like yeah, it's a yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a no-brainer. Anyone who wouldn't sign it should be fired immediately. Uh, yeah, I mean, just just know that just a, there really is no like rule, and it can happen from the drummer being a businessman to uh, you know a band having a fan base like the Grateful Dead or something. It just you can't explain why it just happens, and, or or you have a great song, or you're that writer who can churn out hit after hit after hit. Like, who knows why? And sometimes you can be terrible, and the manager is a friend of the so and so, and it happens anyways. And you know, it, it, there is no reason. When you said the person left my album out, they want questions to let the third album go. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, we just, you know, um, it, it's a cliche, but like. When, when you have a big artist or a big band, everyone's looking for the next version of that. You know, uh, whether it's like uh, the Strokes, then everyone wanted the Hives, and everyone's looking for the next the band, the band. And yet nobody would have touched the songs. But yeah, but nobody would have touched like nobody usually touches that first band. Everyone's scared of it, scared of it, scared of it. Now it's proven. You know, now we need that. You know, so that's a cliche. So until you know. Who knows why that first one breaks too, but they usually tear down the walls and open, open opportunities for everybody else. Um, but it's always that first one that we were talking on the train right out here. Everybody passes around, that's not a hit, that's not a hit, that's not a hit. And all of a sudden it is a hit. And whoops, I was wrong. Um, and careers are built. Uh, I, I wanted to like continue on um, uh, his path. I don't know how to explain it, but I've done the same, I've done the same thing. I'm actually wearing my band shirt. We've done, we've done, you know, clothing. We've done stickers, flyers, promotion. We've had, you know, we played anywhere from the Knitting Factory to Don Hills to plenty of venues. We went on tour for upstate New York. We went to, you know, Olive's Bar. We went to Nyack. We went to a couple places up there. And 
we've already done a lot of things. We went to the next step up, which is, you know, we talked to, you know, TV programming. We went to Rocky TV, which is online TV, but it's still, you know, TV. They actually put us on a 15 minutes skit on MTV. And we've done a lot of, like, major things. Well, major for us, because we're still a small band, but we, we've taken, you know, a lot of time and effort to go out there and reach people. Mm -hmm. What would be the next step after that? What would you think? What, what would be your advice? As well, are, when you're playing these shows in any factory, in Don Hills, you have fans that are coming out? Yeah, we've had fans? about 300, 400, 500. Because depending on the venue side, we can only fit so many in there. <laughs> I mean, the biggest show we played was, I think, 600 people at uh, the Rock Church, which is on Queen Boulevard. That's amazing. I mean, and so... And it was a battle of bands and we actually won. Like, we're, we're working on going more to work soon, but we need to win that out of the I mean, with those numbers, you guys don't have a booking agent? Yeah, no, that would probably be the thing. next step. I mean, we, we pretty much do all the booking on our own, so a booking agent you think would be... I think with those numbers, it's, it's attractive to a booking agent. Definitely, a lot of times they won't take on somebody even if they're talented because they don't have the numbers. They need to make money. And so I think with those numbers, you know, you can definitely shop yourself to, to Asia. I mean, I went a summer without working because the entire summer we were just gigging day after day after day. We went, that was only our first year mm -hmm. as a band together, and within that first year, we grossed about $10,000 between, well, between would, us. I would keep on that path, keep building your fan base, and at that point, industry notices. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to come to you. If they start hearing about you, look at this band that's selling out this show and this show and this show, people catch on to stuff like that. A lot of times people focus too much on the industry when they don't, they shouldn't. They should be focusing on building their fan base. And then the industry will come. I heard somebody once say something that I thought was really wise. They said, with a record label, you might have a career. With a fan base, you will have a career. So even somebody you know that gets signed to a record deal, they're probably not doing as well as you because you're packing places and you have fans coming out to see you. So that's that's valuable. You know, sometimes something is incredibly like why didn't I think of that? It's just googling club booking agent New York and dropping that into Google. You find stuff. You know. There's an amazing, especially with Google, an amazing amount of things of just as an exploration of what, you know, where can I get information? Um, and you find stuff. You know, just, you know, hip hop manager New York. I mean, you know, you do have to hype a little bit, you know, like, like he, Mark was saying about Smoke and Mirrors. Like, I, I, when I'm doing a project, I've had people email me saying, Hi, my name is Byron Hill, I'm an ASCAP writer who has had 60 top 10 country records with, you know, Brooks and Dunn and Garth Brooks and Dolly Parton and blah, 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 and Trisha Hewitt, uh, would you like to write songs for your project? And I'm like, holy mackerel. And it's just like this guy will Google me, he'll put my name into Google, he'll find some address on some website, and boom, he's in and he's working on the project. And that's why that guy had 60 gold records, is he didn't wait for Universal Publishing to pitch him to go right with something, he's out there doing it. Um, I just want to point out a, res a resource that's on this sheet that we were talking about before. The Who's Who Bibles. There are two things. One is called the Music Registry. Uh, music registry. There's actually an, what's called an ANR 411. And it's a record company listing that's updated every like three to six months of like, let's say, you're, you, let's say you love the Jay-Z record and you want to find out like where he signed, you can kind of like, look at the record or, fi or, or find it online that he's, let's say, or he was with Def Jam, I think he went to Live Nation now, but you can find out who's there, who's the our person, and then you have the email address, you can email them. There's also a thing called a Polestar Artist Management Directory, and it's actually a directory of like managers, so if there's somebody who's like your band, let's say it's the Black Eyed Peas that sounds like your band, you get this directory and you look up who you look under the back, the Black Eyed Peas, and it tells you they're managed by whoever, David Sonnenberg. And then you look up David Sonnenberg, DOS Management, and you can call them. And believe me, 300 people is a magic number for fans and clubs, and it's the industry model. You say we're getting 600 people there and 500 people there. We were just on MTV. You kind of give them a short list of we did this, 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 quick, like a politician. And they'll, believe me, they'll be more interested in you than 
needing you than you need them. And so that, that's some of the ways. And I would get like a, a format, an email format together, you know, with like the clubs and the numbers of people you're bringing out. And that's really impressive. Yeah, that you're like, basically. No, 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 I just mean like, kind of like a one sheet, you know, with like your band name, the link to it. We have a bio. Yeah, but just something really simple with numbers, like show those numbers. We've got we've got a, a MySpace account. We've got a uh, it's called Sound 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 Production value wasn't that great because mm -hmm. we just finished, you know, the money that we saved throughout the year. We just finished rebuilding a studio in the house, so mm -hmm. now all our tracks are being re re uh, revamped, basically re-recorded. But most of our stuff is low quality on, on the internet, mm -hmm. but it's good stuff because we get you know plenty of listens. Mm -hmm. You can see how many listens there are, and I mean, I would want to know where I would send those links to them. Where, where would Red, this music registry. Yeah, the yeah the, the, you know, some of these things you can click around this music registry. Again, I, when I reach out to people and I don't know them, I try to find someone who knows someone. And you'll be surprised, again, you're in the right place. So it's like success, the equation is preparation meets opportunity. Like, it may not be that you, like, look up and see Clive Davis's name at whatever RCA and try to get in touch with him. It might be that like your next door neighbor who has like a dog that plays with your dog knows somebody that he took <laughs> to school with. And I've gotten gigs that way. Like I've gotten television shows because of my next door neighbor, not because of my agents of William Morris. So you just have to really put out the word virally with your friends and people know people and if you're really good it's you're gonna go in. That's how we got into that's how we got into Rock and TV. Yeah. Just ask somebody, you can meet somebody, we played in a band that we played with for a long time ago yeah. and they knew some guy. Yeah, you know. It's a really um, like it's not six degrees of separation, it's like two degrees of separation in New York City. Everybody kind of knows somebody who knows somebody else. And um, let's take another question or two and then get okay. to the music. What's the best way to get a distribution deal? Uh, get a distribution company to have to fit, fit a couple of finished products, projects into a CD Baby, uh, iTunes, I sell that my shows, but I'm looking for a, a distribution company. Well, how many? How many records are you selling? Are you selling a lot that you need to expand more than that? Yeah, well, I, I, um, I'm a gospel saxophonist. Mm -hmm. And um, everywhere I play, I sell CDs. I have them in the stores. Um, it's online. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to get them in, like, uh, how to have the catalog and people order from the distribution companies. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't, I think that's an old model. That you don't that that's like the horse and buggy when the, when the airplane came along because we, you are the distribution. Yeah, well, I, I do. My, I'm doing my thing. I know, but that's it. There's, no. there's really um, but, um, until you're at a much bigger level where where you're overwhelmed because hundreds of thousands of people are asking you for your CD and you physically don't have the hours in the day to put things in envelopes, like. Like the, the model is like what you said, CD Baby and TuneCore that put it out to everywhere. My record that's on theorchard.com, you can go to amazon.com and buy my record. I'm on, I'm on Amazon also. Yeah, so you're there. But I, what I'm saying is some places I go to, they say they only order records from catalog from the distribution company. Um, how much, I mean, do you really, I, I think, yeah, that kind of sounds weird and doesn't make sense to me. Well, I guess what they said. You well, know, then, some, some places. You know, they, so I, I wouldn't make that a, a, a sticking point again. Oh, it's no, like that's not the, the, the distributors aren't, are going to, like, if you go to, like, Sony Digital, like, I have a friend who has a deal at Sony Digital, and it's absolutely no different than if I drop a CD in the mail or, or upload it to TuneCore for 10 bucks. There's absolutely no difference between me 
and Sony Digital Distribution at this point. It's the same thing. It sounds like you know any of anybody who wants to buy your CD is going to be able to find it. Okay, so yeah. if I want to get it at Kmart and mm -hmm. Sears. Well, they don't. They probably don't sell emerging artists. And yeah. Those types of not only do they not sell emerging artists, they probably don't sell the new Herbie Hancock record, and he won the Grammy two right. years ago. So, like, you can't demand something from an industry that doesn't exist. It's an old way of thinking. Like, like all of these places, like Walmart was recently discussing ending all music sales. Starbucks started a record company, put out a Bob Dylan record that stiffed. A Paul McCartney record that stiffed, a Joni Mitchell record that stiffed, a bunch of compilations, and they decided to just hand it over to Concord Music and said, you deal with it, we'll put out two records a year instead of 30. So the idea about your record being at Kmart or, or Target or something, it's just, it's a model that's not working for big stars that are Grammy Lifetime Achievement members. So you just, it, it, it's, the, the, pro, the system, the, the problem is, is change your thinking and a miracle happens, which you're the distributor until really you have to hire 30 people because there's so many people buying your record. I am, I am the, uh, you know, I am the, uh, the workforce. I mean, I've gotten in the truck, I've taken to the stores, I've gotten on consignment, I'm doing all that. I, I, I realize that I was just asking that one question, but that's, that's the way I think. I mean, I'm, I'm the president of my record company, my publishing company, I belong to BMI, and I'm doing my thing. You know, it'll actually, until you're really earning so much money, it'll be worse because you get these distributors and they have millions of accounts. You go to Universal Distribution, they have five million people they have to account to every three months. And if you're earning like a few hundred dollars, um, a quarter or something, because maybe a hundred people bought your record, you'll actually probably get paid less than if you just do it yourself. So, so sometimes bigger is not better. 99% of the time. Yeah, right? so let's go to playing some music. Because I know people brought CDs. And can I ask first for people who haven't played anything yet to, to try to give everybody as democratic a process. So whoever hasn't gone, you have something? Yes. I got one. I got one recently. OK. Yay, these guys collaborated on something, so we're going to get it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. If I had a distribution deal with Universal, I'd never get it. <laughs> I'm sorry? I think we're going to, just to get as many people in as possible, like listen to a verse and chorus, or two verses and two choruses, because otherwise we could just take up the whole time on one or two songs. So just like, I'll, I'll point at you. Yeah, yeah, let me know. Okay. 
All right. Mm. Uh, do you want to first tell us how that, he played this guitar as a sort of instrumental. It just had a nice kind of very sort of mellow, classic guitar kind of feeling to it. And then I said, could you be open to writing lyrics? So it's two very different worlds coming together. You want to, how did that come together? How'd you do that? So is uh, it, would, would the, the vision for that be uh, as is, like a car vocal, or with a full production? I mean, I wanted to throw in some beatboxes to keep it like raw, like mm -hmm. acoustic, like. But I mean, I like the way it was. I didn't want to add some more stuff to explore it. So I just left it like that. It sounds great. I mean, the, the, the essence of it, you know, the nice guitar line, the lyrics are strong, the uh, performance is strong. It sounds good, very good. Yeah. Is that how you, how you sound live, or do you guys, mm -hmm. you guys practice doing something live together? I mean, this is the first time I've like, He invited me actually to Dale, but I found out that morning. Let's go for this different, you know, styles together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, if you figure a way to do something interesting with styles that aren't, we're not used to hearing, and it's actually good quality, mm -hmm. you may have, you may have just uh, found something worth pursuing, you know. <coughs> Much of the same after all the time. Yeah, yeah it's collaborations of, you know, if you work together with somebody else, you've got twice as much opportunity that you both know different people because you both have, you know, it's like, don't be afraid of that. If, it, if, it's, if somehow it worked, it was easy, I'd say pursue it. What do you guys think is missing from it right now? Here. Right. You know, my comment on it is that it needs a chorus. Yeah? Yeah. Because, I know, but, you know, it's sort of like, what the chorus I'm thinking of is like, you know, Where is the Love by the Black Eyed Peas. It kind of like has a more rhythmic verse and he's kind of talking, he's not really rapping, but he's telling a story and then it just breaks into this, Where is the love? <laughs> Where is the love? Da, da. And it's just a simple line. And so what I'm missing as a listener is that simple line. Because your, your verses and, and the, what you're saying is they were saying it's, it's actually a really interesting, I'm feeling like kind of hip hop and Latin y kind of something moving together. It's very cool. And I just want one phrase that's really simple, like, where is the love? That, like, if I'm like, half brain dead because I'm driving to work and it's seven in the morning, I'm not awake and I'm in behind my car and I'm just gonna sing something like, like that just, you know, that simple line that repeats and gets into your head and you just hear it, you know, once and you're like, just dance, da 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 just dance, da 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 just dance. Like, I couldn't tell you one other line from that song, but I'll tell you Just Dance, or I'll tell you Yeah by Usher. I can't tell you one word from Yeah, and I've heard it 500 times, but I can go Yeah, Yeah, mm, ah, mm, ah, and I'm missing that from your song. So you're being stingy with me. You're, you're holding out and saying, I don't want to give you the juice. I want to like show you the fruit, but I'm not going to give you the juice. And we want the, the class. Am, am I wrong here? Something? I'm just being... So we have like people representing in the house that are saying they agree, you know what I mean? Are you saying it should be like an overdubbed melodic passage over like one of the parts, like an no, thing? No, no, I'm just saying, can you play from the beginning? I'm just saying over the same chords, you need like a, a like a less rhythmic thing, more that melodic. more melodic thing. 
What, what is the title of the song? I call it the Abstract World. Okay. Thanks. Do you have something? No, he's... Get this in there. Has everybody seen the email list? By the way, everybody's written down something on the email list, so, okay, good. This is something I just recorded last night, actually. Um, I, there's a female artist on there I'm rapping on it, but there's also a female artist on there. I wrote it for a female artist, so um, I wrote all the lyrics, I did all the production, and she's a son. Okay, great.
open to comments. You know, yeah. I want I want honest everything. Cause okay. Like, what me I'm like I'm so I so always surround myself with people that's gonna be honest with me and everything, so I could get better at what I'm doing. You know, so anything if you. Can you I see some hands like you. Do you guys want to comment yeah. on this song? I agree with I agree with him on that. Me and my friend got this, but um, I felt like it was rushed. Like when you say you recorded it last night, it sounded like you recorded it. Like very right. rushed. Mm -hmm. She she probably just didn't take time to read the lyrics and emphasize on certain yeah. parts, and sing certain parts, and I don't think her words was clear. Like right. it wasn't very demanding. It was just like very sloppy. Okay, um, we won't know if I was singing the scenes, but he has his opinion. I don't think that it's so much the same. I think it's a matter of like how it was mixed. There's a um, some brassiness. Yeah, the brassy that persists too loud. What you might want to try is let it drop out. Definitely from the beginning of the song. For verses, the listener needs to hear what the singer's saying, right? And with that plane, it's conflicted. So if you take that out, people will probably be able to hear the singer a little bit better. The song is very good, especially considering that you did it in what one week it is, and then you just keep on working, you know, on it and whatnot. But concentrate on the mixing <coughs> and your instrumentation. Dropping instruments out, let others come in. You know, you could have added in a bass line to spice up. The, the chorus, yeah. the chorus begins. Let let adds you know some bass there, and let the other instrument drop out. Because when you keep it persisting, it the ear gets tired, especially if it's just one or two notes that keep playing all throughout. One one thing I really um, I critique myself. One thing I really wanted was kind of like a drop with like a nice little piano in the background. But I was looking for a really good pianist, and like, I'm not a great pianist myself, but I mean, with the time and everything, I wanted to get something else so I could get uh, get in here today. But, I personally, I think it's a really good sketch. I, mm -hmm. And uh, I think, strangely enough, I think for me, the hook was uh, was a book when she's like, mm -hmm. oh, pack up and go. Like that was more of a hook to me than I think the actual chorus. Okay. Um, mm. And you know, maybe actually that's funny because that was my first idea for the hook. <laughs> really? Yeah. I would. I would personally, I would have brought it in sooner and I would have repeated it more. Um, just you know, just actually that that part repeats every every verse. Okay. Okay. So you know, I think it's just an issue of finding the sweet spots and, and, and working it. What he said about that little keyboard. It's something I learned as a producer a long time ago that synthesizers, uh, acoustic guitars, hi-hats from the drums, which are, in this case, it's going da-da-da-da-da, it's playing like kind of a hi-hat rhythm, are right in the vocal range. So you have to sort of duck, like if you pull something down, it makes something else pop out. So it's just being aware of, like you always want the vocal to be clear, which was their comment, like you hear it and you know what it's saying, especially because you're, you're presenting this as something new. You know, if, if Beyonce did this, you could just go ah, 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 and people would buy it because it's Beyonce, but you're new, so you have to like, you have to give, not have one reason for someone to say no, you have to have them every reason to say yes, and I agree about that little hook thing, that stuck out to me and jumped, and so I'd like focus on that and like, like put them, uh, blow that up bigger kind of thing. That's the part that keeps ringing in my head still now, like I can still hear it. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, I mean, it had the perfect formula for a hit song. Like, that's what you're hearing out there right now. And then you just clean it up in those ways, in the mixing ways, and, you know, concentrate on the hook, bring that out. I think you got a really good song. Yeah. Is there somebody else who wanted to say something about it? Okay. We have another one? I have a full track on that, but you can play it on the first one. It's the second track. Like, it introduces itself, I talk a little and then I dance with the rest of my heart, of course. Do you want us to hear that one or do you want us to go forward from the intro? Nah, you can play it first. Okay. The second one actually has a famous guest appearance, but I'm more confident in the first one. Yeah, it's your job. Ain't no suicide coming around. The cars come out, the windows roll down. Niggas don't think music's so hard, they try to forget about everything. 
forget about the girls. No, hey, 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 hey,
actual era. Oh. I didn't want that. So. But I'm open to all of that. I love the concept. I mean, I think that people forget that songs should have a lot of meaning, and it sounds like that has a lot of meaning to you, and that really touched me, you know, hearing your oh. story about it. And I just, I, I thought it was great. I think you have a great rapping voice. I think it's catchy. It's good. You know, in general, from the things we've heard so far, tying into what I talked about first, like the work is actually surprisingly, because we haven't, I mean, we could spend a whole workshop just saying nothing and having people just play songs, like, and that would take like 10 weeks. Like, the, the work is surprisingly really good, and again, the best thing you could do is just make one, like, one or two songs that just the production value, the singing, the enunciation on yeah, your song, I, everything just spot on so that you, you meet someone, because people form, we live in the Twitter world where, you, like, you're, you've got 40 characters to tell somebody some life important thing. So you, want, you don't want to make people wait for your 10th song to find something they like. They want to, like, in the first 20 yeah, seconds be boom. And all these works are good, and I would just, if anything, just say make your prediction slam. And then, and then audit it. Like, go to iTunes and listen to what's on iTunes in the top 10, and then play your song and see how it compares. Because it's, you know, people are cutting stuff on GarageBand and Pro Tools and Cubase and Logic and Reason, and, and it, it doesn't cost that much, and you want it to just sound good. And if you're not a mixer, throw it at a mixer. That, that was done on Reason. Yeah, so throw it at a mixer who can kind of like finish it and polish it up so you hear all the little things coming in and maybe adds like a low sub frequency to the bass so it pumps, you know, and steps out of the way of the vocal and all of that stuff, you know. Yeah, I think the kind of music that you're doing is so, it, it's so, relies so heavily on the production, you know, so don't sell yourself short uh, and just not have that production there because it, it, a lot of us won't be able to hear what's potential in it and uh, and yeah I mean it, it's such unfortunately now it's such a huge part of, of the craft of songwriting now that you really should be really well versed in, in, in how to record and you know at least enough to be presentable and I have oh, this is going to kill me uh, <laughs> it's always difficult from my my experience is like more often than not, if someone has the opportunity to play a song, I'm not saying like this because this is cool, this is a workshop and this is what it's about, but like if you were to sit down with an A&R person or something, I find more often than not, um, somebody will play their grade B work instead of their grade A work. And I'm not sure what the psychology is there, but they're like, oh, well, if someone's like, oh, that's not that good, they're like, oh, well, I've got a better song. Well, why didn't you play that one first? Exactly. And, and, exactly. and you should know, like, the, the hardest thing is to be your own judge. Like, if I say to someone, oh, I'm looking for a hit song, Everyone's like, oh, I got a hit song. And the truth is, you probably have a good song. And there's a difference between a good song, a great song, and a hit song. And if you're talking to people about hit song, you should know the difference. And that sometimes it's, it's hard to step back and hear a song. Is this a hit song or is this a good song? And so bounce well, it off people what do you first. you personally like to hear? Because that I feel like was a well written song, but a great song. But I think number two, with, um, I have OJ the Juice Man on mm -hmm. the famous album. That's a hit song. Okay. I've done that in club. Yeah, well that's good. If you know that, and you know, I'm not saying this is different because it's a workshop and this is all about the critiquing and all that, but like if you, if, if you were going to play it for Brooke, you know, and you were trying to get a deal or something like that, like I would expect, I would hope you'd come to the table with your A-level a song, you know what I mean? Okay. And you know, the difference between a good song and a hit song, I mean it's, it's a very, um, you know, there's a lot of opinions about what the difference is, but, I, and I'm not going to offer something scientific to you, but there are certain songs that just stand out to me, like the chorus of Rihanna's Umbrella. Like, that, that chorus just stands out. And the chorus of Paparazzi, that's also on people's ringtone now, like, it's the most annoying thing, because half the week I spend just trying to get rid of Lady Gaga. And then after the MTV Awards, it's impossible. Like. So something that just people hear and then they remember, they're just like, it drills it in. That's why I said to that first song, give me something like Where Is The Love, like that chorus of Black Eyed Peas, because I may not remember about them rapping about the CIA and the FBI and the man is coming, and where's the love and we're America, what happened? I may not remember that, but I'll remember Where Is The Love, Where Is The Love. I don't know, and each person listening gets a different interpretation of what that means to them. 
So did you remember right out? Um, a little bit. A little bit. Okay. So we, we kind of have to wrap it up because we're a little bit over time. And, uh, and again, it's heartbreaking. I feel like it's one of these things, this could go on. This is, could go on, you know. Can you like the first minute or the first shot? Um, how much time? What's that? You're kind of tired. You should wrap it up. You do have to wrap it up. All right. Uh, I wanted to give one to my car. And yeah, if anybody has something they want to leave behind here for Mark like or for Brooke or for myself, please, like, we, we can hang out for a few minutes. That's why I'm ending it early. So if you want to talk to these guys, you know, ask them for anything, give them a card or a CD. So thank you all for the privilege and honor of being here.